Hi, everybody. Um, so we're going to get going. Uh, it's just us and you. And we're going to try to make this more of a conversation because the topic is really um, that it, it lends itself to that sort of approach. It's not really heavily presentation driven and didactic. It's more sort of a set, set of observations and experiences and things of that nature. So what we're here to talk about is what has kind of gained the label of what we're calling digital flames, which is the idea that both um, actively and passively our memories and our experiences are being subsumed by the digital world and leaving us the poorer for it and changing what it means to remember, what it change, changes what it means to know, um, changes what it means to archive, um, and what it, how, to, how we exist. Um, so I'm Kent Anderson. I'm the uh, founder and CEO of Caldera Publishing Solutions. I was the founder of the Scholarly Kitchen. I run the Geyser. I've been a publisher for a long time. And uh, I'm basically just a big uh, a guy with a big mouth. Um, but you now are going to be subjected to that for the next little while, uh, except when my friend Karen Wolf talks. And you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hello. I'm Karen Wolf. I'm the director of the Omohundro Institute for Early American History and Culture, which is a publisher, funder, and convener in the field of early American history. And I'm also a history professor at William and Mary. Yeah. And um, Karen and I had a really interesting uh, lunch uh, a couple of years ago mm -hmm. um, in my town, Westboro, Massachusetts. And and I said, Oh, Karen, you like this? It's his, you know historical. She was up there. You were up there for yeah. a, uh, a historical meeting. And, um, and we were eating in a restaurant in town, and I said, oh, it's going to be our 300th anniversary. And she said, oh, I have a favorite history book about Westboro. And I'm like, there's a history book about Westboro? <laughs> and sure enough, I was able to get, uh, you know, like a Kinko's bound copy off of Amazon, and I read it, and it is fantastic. I mean, it's so <laughs> nicely written, and it's like all this stuff from the, you know, 18th and 19th centuries. And it's like, that pond's still there. I know that house. Now I know why Parkman Lane is such a, you know, is where it is, and I'm all about him and how the town drummed him out and all this stuff. So thank you for that. That was fantastic. <laughs> so what kind of inspired this session, I think, was a, a post that I wrote um, for the Geyser a little over a year, about a, I don't know, a year ago, a half a year ago, called Are We Gradually Being Erased? And the observation was that I was reading Kindle books. How many of you have Kindles or read books electronically? We call it a milk. A note, we can call it an ebook. An ebook reader will debrand it. Uh, ebook reader, and what I was noticing is that I would have lower recall reading those books. I would not even remember sometimes that I'd read the book, um, and I was starting to attribute it to the fact that I didn't handle it. I didn't see the spine. I didn't see the cover off, and I would forget who the author was, and that wasn't normal for me. And when I read a book, I typically I have good retention. I used to remember phone numbers like crazy. How many of you can tell me your significant other's phone number? Yeah, how many of you can tell me it's one of your children's phone numbers? Nope. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> not a yeah, well, congratulations, actually. Um, but um, the, the challenge is that we don't actually interact with devices to enter those numbers anymore. So we just see a face and we press it, and that's it, and it goes off. Um, and I vaguely recognize the last four digits of my, my not significant other's phone number. Um, but then I would compare that experience to reading a physical book, and I would, and my wife complains about the number of books that we have around the house. And I said, well, that's just part of my brain turned inside out, so I can tour it every once in a while, so just leave me alone. <laughs> and I noticed that you know my record albums had gone away, and I used to remember those and sort them alphabetically and all of that, because I'm a little OCD. But when I would go and look at a book again, I would, I would actually remember, because humans have associative memories, and so you would, I would pick up a book and I'd be like, I remember where I bought this, I remember who I bought this from, I remember the kind of day it was, I remember all this stuff about it, and you know, uh, some instances of reading it, I remember who signed this one, all of that kind of stuff. So we have associative memories, and the fewer physical objects we have to prompt those, the more detrained that memory becomes. And computers have what they call addressable memory. So I, if, a, if my experiences were actually programmed, retained by computer memory, you would be able to say, look at what happened to him on this day at this time, and you might find that I bought a book that day. But you, that's, that's the difference in the memory. Another way of thinking about it is humans have recognition memory and recall memory. Recognition is much more straightforward and normal for us. It's like when you, 
uh, when you just, you know, you'll, you know, like if you hear a snatch of a song, you're like, all of a sudden you recognize it and you're like, are transported somewhere else. But if you had to recall that and say, okay, you know, say, give me a Percy Sledge song right off the top of your head, you know, you can't do that. Um, so physical objects, experiences, spatial experience, all of these things prompt our memories and tr keep our memories trained up um, so that they are functioning. And one of the premises of this post was that the, the more we turn over those things, so that Facebook is telling us where we were five years ago, or how many of you have ever had to look up on Amazon to remember, did you or do you have this one thing because you ordered it? Yeah, yeah. Um, so they are they are keeping our memories um, better than we are because they have addressable memory and they have very good functional databases and things like that. Um, how many of you still um, have? Pictures printed, photos printed. Yeah, um, there is a great part, a great post where they're talking about how the memory of the functional memory of younger people is not the same because they don't have physical pictures. They don't actually insert them into albums or remember which album it's in. And again, all this spatial kind of stuff, touching, tactile, things of that nature. Um, so, you know, this kind of led to. Um, a, a discussion with people here at the conference, and you know, so we're going to be having a, kind of more of an exploration of this tonight. There's going to be a dinner and things of like that with a small group of people to talk about: Do we turn this into some sort of bigger initiative? Um, another part that kind of led me into this, and then I'll turn it over to Karen, was um, a post I wrote before this one on another uh, publication called Remember that I called Remembering How to Remember. And I was having the experience with Google Maps where I would use it all, everywhere. And my wife and I went to Stockholm, which is lovely. And if you've ever had actual Swedish meatballs, they're amazing. Um, but one day we went out and we used Google Maps to get around everywhere. And then the next day I said, no, it's not. There's signs and there's places. And the experience was totally different. It was pleasant. It was, we would explore. We would look around, and I had a similar experience in London where I went around without a Google Maps, and my wife went around with it, and we compared notes, and I said, oh, did you go down Guitar Street? She's like, what's Guitar Street? And I said, it's the street with all the guitar stores. And she's like, I didn't never go. And I said, did you go down this street? She yeah. She never noticed there were guitar stores because she was looking at her phone so much. Um, so again, it, it also removes us from the world and our knowledge of the world. We don't look at others as much. We don't have our heads up as much. All those things. And then I started to, I was driving to a bunch of new places um, and I would use Google Maps and again detrain myself so I became dependent on it. Then one day I thought, okay, I'm actually just going to turn it off and try to find my way there like, a, like I used to. And you just feel this part of your brain become active again. And it's like, okay, I actually remember how to remember. I remember how to read signs and think about where I might be. Um, so I just, I think this is an important area, so we're going to talk a little bit about how our identities, our memories, our ability to remember are all sort of going up in what we're calling digital flames, and what that might mean for TEND and what we might do to meet it, so. Cool. Um, so for me, this, um, this partly comes out of, um, well, first of all, anytime you want to talk about memory, um, and you engage a historian, you're going, to, <laughs> you're going to get a kind of different perspective. Um, but for me also, um, as a publisher, but also as an active researcher and scholar, um, the incredible investment that we're making right now in creating digital books, long-form reading in digital um, format, worries me a lot because, although I think all of the research that um, publishers have done about monographs in particular shows that the way people use those digital books is alongside physical books. Even my graduate students, they they use them to search or they pull things out of them, but they don't actually read really digitally. Um, because deep reading still seems to, at least in the research that we have thus far, require the kind of multi-sensory experience. Um, but what we're doing in the kind of publishing and library world in general is we're driving very hard towards digital capacity. Um, and that worries me a lot, because I, I worry about deep reading. Now, there is a history of reading. 
which says people never read the way we think they read. You know, a um, great historian of the book just recently published something saying, you know, like our, our fantasy about people always like reading in super deeply, not true. But whether that's the case or not, the point is that our capacity for deep reading seems to be genuinely um, corroded by, uh, by digital, digital text. People don't engage it the same way. Um, for me, and you know, this isn't just a like, you know, middle-aged kind of thing, but it is true that for me, I do engage with text um, in an analog way. I do still write on things. I, you know, put marginalia all over my stuff. Anyway, but when Kent wanted to talk about this, I wanted to take this in a, a slightly different direction, but I think a complementary direction, which is the kind of the history of digital surrogacy for um, research in my field, which is in the 18th century and why it is that the kind of digital representations that we are making of all kinds of things, whether it's mapping or whether it's you know, contact information or whatever, have a curious, I think, and I'll be interested to see how the conversation develops, a curious connection with the way that we've preserved historical records over time. And that is this, that we prioritize and put a whole lot of resources into certain kinds of preservation, and the kinds of preservation that we put a lot of resources into tend to reflect hierarchies of power and values and contexts. So I want to just, um, and not just because I'm like, let's talk about the 18th century, but let's talk about the 18th <laughs> century. Um, so, so basically, um, I've been working for a long time on a book about, um, and I'm finishing, I'm really finishing this book, about uh, about genealogy in the 18th I'm century. I'm not a publisher, so I <laughs> became defensive toward me. But, uh, <laughs> Sure you will. <laughs> I, I think I keep saying I'm finishing it for the last year. I've been saying I'm finishing it. Anyway, I'm fin I'm fin I'm finishing this book. Um, but it's about it's about how individuals practice genealogy in the 18th century. But it's also how genealogy is really a practice of cultures and societies, and that reflects their investment in particular kinds of hierarchies of power um, and synergies actually um, between individuals, families, and um, organizations such as governments. Um, so most of my work is concerns people who are marginal, people who are powerless, unfree people. Um, but in one part of the book, I focus on founding fathers and their obsession with genealogy. And I think this little illustration with George Washington does get us back to a question about digital surrogacy, which will wrap us back to this topic, um, which is this one document um, at the Library of Congress, which is this um, family tree that George Washington created when he was 16 years old. So, right, um, so this is George Washington's family tree. Um, you can see on the, in the upper left there, you can see how it's, um, it's tipped into a volume. It's actually in these massive red leather-bound volumes that are at the Library of Congress and the papers of George Washington. They are, they're these huge elephant folio volumes and, um, and they've got, you know, um, little um, onion skin paper between each document and the whole thing. Anyway, so this is at the Library of Congress um, and uh, it doesn't say George Washington on it, so um, I can explain why we know it's George Washington. But anyway, um, what he shows is four generations of his direct lineage. Um, and I've pointed out George here. He's in the, that long middle line, and he's around in the middle of that third line there. So this is George Washington creating this when he's about 16 years old. Um, what's interesting, well, there are many interesting things about this, and I could go on, but... Um, one thing that's particularly interesting about it is that when you um, is that when you turn this document over, um, on the other side of this Washington family tree is a list of tithables, and tithables are enslaved people on whom slaveholders paid tax. Tithable lists are incredibly rare; there aren't lots of them that survive. Um, we'll get to this question about survivals too, um, but there aren't many of them that survive. All of these people. Um, who are listed here from Akka down to Judo, uh, Judah um, appear on other Washington family plantation records. And I know for various reasons of internal evidence that Washington wrote that listed about 1753. And what you can see down way here in the corner, turned to the side, is something that says the genealogy of the Washington family in Virginia. So this is a two-sided document. Um, it's at the Library of Congress. You can see that the seam there is at the bottom there, and it's on the side there. So um, this is me creating a facsimile of that document because I wanted to test how, in its actual size, it would fit into George Washington's um, study. 
So I went into uh, his study at Mount Vernon with uh, some preservationists <coughs> and some people who are expert in not just uh, the renovation, uh, the restoration of the building, but also in cabinetry and so on, to see how, why he was, if you see how it's folded there, why was he putting that label on that size? Is this, this is a standard paper size for the 18th century, um, but would it fit precisely in these um, particular cubby holes that he had built in the 1780s? Answer is absolutely yes. It probably would have been, I have it on its side there, so that you, that's actually, is it resting in George Washington's study? Um, but it wouldn't have been sitting like that. It would have been probably stacked up and tied, tied with ribbons in, um, in bundles. Um, but the folds that I could see on the paper and that you can see represented there and that I've um, reproduced in my facsimile version of it, make it, um, it, it rests right there. Uh, can I ask a question? Yeah, absolutely. And I know you're a historian yeah. and you're going to have an answer. Um, or not, maybe. But <laughs> you're testing this about Vernon, but you said he wrote this when he was 16. He wasn't living about Vernon. Was no, 16. but he saved it. Okay. He saved it. Um, and uh, he saved So there's a long history of the preservation of this document, why it is where it is. Um, George Washington is actually pretty obsessed with his papers. Um, when he is, um, when he's general of the Continental Army, he employs multiple secretaries. George III, in fact, at this time had no secretary. Okay. Wrote his own stuff. Wrote a lot more than George Washington. But George Washington had multiple secretaries and he um, commissions um, leather trunks to hold his papers so that they will be preserved for all time. And one of the reasons why I wanted to test this is because there's a moment in the 1790s when he comes back to Mount Vernon and he commissions, in fact, this very cabinet to hold my particular papers. So I wanted to know, would this object have fit into the cabinet which he calls holding his particular papers? Because the man has thousands of things and they would have been, and there were, there were closets that are stuffed with boxes and trunks. So yeah. They have from Alexandra. Yeah. I find this very satisfying. So. Yeah. <laughs> as, very as, good. as a wit has once described, every man has a stupid system. So, um, or a particular system. So a particular he has, system. He has, he, he has, I think he, it sounds like he had a system that went back into his teenage years. He, he, he did. And I mean, it, so the, the question for me, and it's related to our digital flames thing, is um, why does this particular document survive. Um, most of our thinking about what we preserve, Kent has described a kind of um, dystopian future in which we have no memories and what memory we have is, you know, given to some entities and some objects which may in fact be erased entirely. We have no control over it. But the truth is that most of what we know about the past is actually entirely accidental and very little of it survives. George Washington, this piece from George Washington survives entirely because George Washington is a super famous guy and because if you want to learn anything about the 18th century, there are very few people who produced enough written material and we've already, our society has given value to written text as historical object um, and material that people were willing to preserve over time and then catalog and move around. Now one thing that it's kind of interesting about this piece though is that this particular <laughs> item um, uh, I tried to trace its provenance to where did he have it first and then where did it end up. So it's at the Library of Congress now um, and in the 1960s it was microfilmed along with a whole series of other Washington stuff and it was assigned this date of 1753 which is wrong. Um, and then in 2000 the microfilm was scanned. So we now have um, a surrogate of the surrogate item. Um, and I can tell, and of course you are looking at my surrogate back here, right? Those are my images of the actual thing. Um, so when I, I have done gene work on people who are working on genealogy in the 18th century for a long time, and <coughs> a long time for me to figure out that this Washington piece had these two sides. And that's because two things. One, all the documentary editions of George Washington's uh, life and letters and so on, of which there have been many. The most recent is the authoritative University of Virginia Press um, documentary editing project, which is now in its 50th year and gazillion volumes. But there were previous editions of George Washington's papers. None of them included this object. A. B. When the Library of Congress cataloged this item, they cataloged, they did not catalog the title list. So only the genealogical chart was cataloged and then it was never, and it was never included in any George Washington biographies, or at least I've looked at a lot of biographies and all the 
you know, major George Washington biographies. Maybe there's a new one that's coming out in February by a feminist scholar, and maybe it will include it. But no one has addressed this. So when we talk about what we preserve and why and how it gets preserved, here I'm talking about an object from probably, arguably one of the most famous Americans of all time, the, certainly the most privileged, whose materials have been lavished with attention and certainly our public funding for preservation, conservation, cataloging, reproduction, facsimile after facsimile. And yet, the fact that he was listing these people and the names of those individuals on that list remained obscured to us. And why is that? That is because um, genealogy as a subject was not the real interest to historians and biographers. It seemed like a kind of um, you know, girly thing for George Washington to be interested in. It also seemed like a kind of benign, domesticated interest of what significance could this possibly be. I can tell you from my research that genealogy is absolutely a political act. It is incredibly um, it, uh, fraught, and, and George Washington is practicing it exactly that way. And I have to go on about that. But, <laughs> it's, but, a, it's, a, it's but, interesting because this is, uh, at one level, he, I mean, we're kind of talking about two things, right? So you have, I'm, I've, what brought me into this was sort of the observation that personal memories and personal uh, recollections are kind of being sucked away, <clears throat> taken away, steeped away slowly by the digital space. And you are talking in some level about cultural memory, right? The cultural, what, what do we remember about our culture? What do we preserve? Yeah. And, and, and but this is, this is an instance of him trying to remember personal things, and now we're we're have some insight into what he was willing to and able to remember and willing to preserve yeah. and willing to state as a as a fact of his and there's life. Another, but then there's another level to that too because there's you know this entire field of digital preservation right. talking about to what what are we obligated to preserve right. essentially of the digital yeah. realm what of those photos and texts and all these things and what about you know so. Well, so there's an interesting, so a sidelight. How many of you heard about the Universal Studios fire? Two, three. Yeah. It's something that they've kept quiet. Um, and it was in 2008. <coughs> and 500,000 master recordings were destroyed, including Aretha Franklin, Dizzy Gillespie, Chuck Berry, The Kingsman, Louie Louie. Bill Haley and the Comets, Rock Around the Clock, and Etta James at last. All the master recordings destroyed. They've kept it very quiet because in their view, because all these recordings are out visually and on our phones and everything, nothing was really lost. But what, what audiophile sound engineers and others are discovering is that when they go back to source recordings and they remaster them using new tools, mm -hmm. they are discovering all sorts of new layers and new yep new ways, I mean, the, I guess, and I've heard this, I haven't bought it, but I've heard it, the Beatles have re-released new master recordings, uh, remastered recordings of, of their major albums, and you listen to the 1960s, 70s version mm -hmm. compared to the remastered off the same source, it's amazing the layers that they're able to pull out of that now. Um, so, you know, in, in this case, you know, so preserving things, um, digital facsimiles in this case are not adequate and what what they imprinted at the time that the, of that fire was all we, all we will ever have we'll never be able to go back in and pluck out um the the great things and then um i'm just going to tell the story because i think it's funny how many of you know the song mustang sally mm -hmm. yeah so they recorded that on tape um right as they finished it um the tape broke flew off the spool landed on the floor, like, you know, everything went all over the place, sound in there, told everybody to get out of the room, taped it back together, and that's what we all listened to. Um, <laughs> so there's actual tape on tape, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, you know, um, if that had been a crashed hard drive, nothing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, um, but I think these, these are all related, right? So what you are going to remember about what the a Beatles song sounds like is, you know, it's going to, may change if you listen to the remastered one, whereas, you know, Etta James is going to always sound the same um, because we're not going to be able to go back in and, and make that sound better. So. Well, I would say that it is the same. So, you know, we're, at least in my field, we're spending a lot of time and attention on digitizing materials like this, which is great because we have 
much better capacity to do that than we used to. Obviously, those scans that the Library of Congress has up thinks they're adequate, and you have to you have to really work very hard to get in to see the, their originals. They, it's really a hard go, let me just say. Um, why? Da, 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 da. But obviously, there are things I can know from looking at the actual object. Um, even though I have pretty good images that I took myself now that are way better than those scans of the microfilm, there are things I know from looking at that, like the fold, for example, um, that you can't see in the, um, in the, micro, the scanned microfilm. But another example of that would be um, James Madison's notes of the Constitutional Convention, where um, you know Madison takes these incredible notes during the hot summer of 1787 when they're in Philadelphia writing the Constitution. Um, and then at some point, we all get this like edited documentary edition of the text of Madison's notes, right? Well, there's a long history of the edition of Madison's notes. But really interestingly, a scholar has been, had persuaded the Library of Congress to use very up-to-date technology and go back and do some very close looking at what he's doing. And you can see how Madison, many years after the convention, revised his notes and kind of cleaned up what he was saying and kind of moved some things around and so on. And it's really revealing and quite important. So in other words, if we didn't have these, there are so many things that we need the thing for. Like the thingness of the thing is quite important. So it, it does fire our memory and it does fire our senses. And there's something about um, that we can't even really explain really about the way that our sensory interactions are so complex when we have a physical object. But it's also true that the digital surrogates can be helpful mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. You know, like they, they do their own thing. Right. Um, so if it's viewed as additive, yeah. then fine. But if substitution is kind of the, the mentality that a lot of people possess. Right. 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 And that's probably a mistake. Right. Um, I, would, I would say so. And I, I mean, I think that's the biggest problem with, um, with digital books, actually, is that, I mean, I think for, you know, I don't know They're how you all feel, too. but I, I read on my notebook, I just read fiction that, uh, you know, I'll forget it, and then even authors I really, really like, I'll mostly forget what I've read, and so it's great, because the next year I can read it again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's not like, I never buy anything for work, I cannot read anything for work that way, and my yeah. students who have to use the digital copies that are in the library, um, because of cost and so on, they really dislike it intensely. It's amazing. And that they, they use their Apple pen now to mark up their PDFs, and that's somewhat better mm -hmm. because they're trying to interact with it, you know, in a tactile, in a tactile way. Yeah. It's so tough. There's another aspect I wanted to talk about, and then I wanted to see like, how we can all talk. Mm -hmm. um, and that's about the design of the digital space. And I, I think that the best way I've been able to put this in my own words is that it's designed for distraction. Um, everything about the digital space is pretty much designed to distract you. A lot of that has to do with the economics of it, has to do with the device builds. How many of you have ever caught yourself, I will admit to this, having the TV on, a laptop on, and your phone? Three, have a two or three screen experience. Okay, <laughs> it's working on the laptop. <laughs> yeah. um, so the, the, term for what we're seeing develop as far as habits of people is continuous partial attention. Um, people are always paying a little bit of attention to everything. And the other thing, the, the way that I heard somebody put how the digital space behaves with news feeds and all of these things, and, you know, you reload Twitter, you reload Facebook, you reload the Washington Post, is you're basically playing an attention slot machine. It's like, anything good? Anything good? <gasps> Three cherries, yeah. Yeah. There's, a, there's a tweet from Karen. Right? Yeah. Um, and the business models reward distraction. They, the more you click, the more you reload, the more you're distracted, the more you're paying continuous partial attention, the more money Facebook and Google and those other places make. The more you search to look something up because you can't remember who the actor was in the movie and you can't remember who the actor was, so I'm going to look it up. Yeah. And guess what? Google just made some money because you can't talk it out. Um, and you guys have detrained memory now, and so you can see how this turns into sort of a cycle where the more they detrain your memory, the more dependency they create, the more they, can, they, they get your continuous partial attention, and pretty soon you're, uh, you're the, what they call the fuel of their business, and your, your detrained memory is, um, is part of their, their, uh, the benefit that they get. Um, so I think that that's, that's another part of it has kind of 
piqued my interest in this is sort of how do we change the economics of attention so that they actually work in favor of people thinking longer, harder, and not have, and having focused attention and, and really thinking things through. Um, and then one other aspect of this is, you know, you talked about what's preserved, the political decisions about yeah. what is preserved and what's not. And we're in a time where there are, where the politics of information have probably never been more glaring. Um, and I remember reading the Mueller report and noting that there were messages that he couldn't get copies of because of encryption. Mm -hmm. Messages from gov public officials to other public officials that, uh, that, that the government couldn't see because of encryption. And you have the whole Apple encrypted phone, they won't open it up, and all of this because of privacy, but guess what, warrants probably Trump privacy, sorry to use the word Trump, I hate that word now, <laughs> but, um, but you, you start to think about how much of the historical record is being hidden by encryption, that's a new variable. Um, as far as cultural memory goes, and you know what's you know what uh, you know besides somebody holding up their phone and letting you take pictures of their WhatsApp, what's actually going to break that apart? Um, so lots of things going on in this space. I would say, um, you know, that as a person living in this time, of course, I feel all of that super keenly. Um, but you know, when you look at it from the perspective, the long perspective. Mm -hmm. We've always only ever had partial information. People have only ever had partial information and encryption. You know, I mean, they're, they 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 were doing that then. I think right. you know that. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. but you know, lots of I mean, ciphers. yes, lots of ciphers, lots of ciphers, all really complex stuff. So people have always been working with partial information. I think the difference is that there was this odd moment in the late 20th century mm -hmm. where we had an expectation, and it was sort of at the cusp of and at the beginning of the internet age where we had this expectation that you would have all information or you could have all information and that all, I mean, the National Archives preserves three to five percent of all government records. That's right. it. And, and that's, and that's, you know, that's a lot. That's I mean, it's, it's yeah. an overwhelming amount. And yeah. obviously we are annoyed because we think the Presidential Records Act is being um, disregarded right. and that, you know, we're not getting the full information, especially out of the agencies, actually. It's not so much the White House, but the agencies, which are not preserving the records that we need in order to see what's happening, what policy is being made. Right. Um, but that's, I think it's, we have to think about what is our expectation mm -hmm. for- In the historical context. Yeah, exactly, in the longer historical context. Because the thing is, when you say that thing about our attention is being fractured and commodified and all that, that is true. Our neurology is not gonna change with 10 years of whatever. I mean, our experience is, but our neurology is still, you know, it took tens of thousands of years for people to, you yeah. know, Get the reading brain together. Yeah. So you know we're not going to shed it in. But to your years. to your tactile experience observation, which I totally agree with. I remember reading a, a book by a brain surgeon who said that he had operated on so many people after by the time he got into his 60s and 70s, he was no longer convinced that the mind was just in the brain. Mm -hmm. He thought the mind mm -hmm. was the whole neurological yeah. system working yeah. in concert. Which again gets back to the whole notion that you know touch, yeah. smell, um, auditory, spatial. Proprioception. Yeah. Yes. Um, yes. You know, all of that stuff yeah. factors into what you remember, what you recall. Yeah. Oh, so, no. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And people who work on meetings say that. Yeah. You know, that, that is, you know, that we're, yeah. we're How many of you remember going down a roller coaster? Yeah. <laughs> Not much reading involved in that. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyhow, so. Anyway. Any of this pique your interest? Are there any particular This is supposed to be a lively conversation, <laughs> so that's how it was built. So, yeah, you know. so now it's on you. <laughs> <laughs> kind of a, a couple things, but kind of off the topic about your tactile um, thing is, I worry about the the young children now. Not that I mean the college students are still using both, you know, yeah. but the young children that get started out on mm -hmm. the devices and like when I was a kid, I remember my first fat book mm -hmm. I read was The Secret Garden. Mm -hmm. I mean it was back then, but mm -hmm. you know, and I still remember that. And I felt such a sense of accomplishment. And these kids have, I mean, oh, I finished my book on my Kindle, my pad, yeah. and my pad still looks the same. Yeah. The yeah, yeah. yeah you can't, you can't flats, worry at yourself. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So just, yeah. It's, it's gone. It's not tangible. And, yeah. and I feel bad that they don't have that experience. Yeah. Um, I have two young kids, and I take a lot of pictures of them. And they're all backed up to Google Photos. Um, and Google Photos has the ability to make books, 
Mm -hmm. um, and so I've started making books of pictures from like special events or whatever. And my four year old will sit and just leaf through the books. Like he mm -hmm. loves, he's like, Mommy, read this book. Mm -hmm. And he hands me a picture book of like our summer vacation. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm like thinking in my head, for Christmas, I'm just going to print out the highlights of the last year in a book and yeah. give them to the kids yeah. for Christmas because he knows we're taking the pictures, but he doesn't actually ever get to see them. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, there are some other um, companies that do the same thing where you can yeah. print out mm -hmm. books. Well, I think that, I mean, that thing about the visual, our memory for the visual is also like, not to be like a broken record here, but. Um, but, you know, until the mid 20th century, nobody had any expectation that you would have a visual record mm -hmm. of the people that you were closest to. Um, and, you know, remember when, when, when I was a kid, people would take your picture and then you would wait yeah. and then they would come back. <laughs> and, and, yeah, you know, and also you would have like this fat thing of like 90% terrible pictures yes. or random <laughs> pictures or whatever, you know. Yeah. Um, so it, I, I think, you know, there, there was only a brief moment um, I guess with Polaroids and things, where you would take a picture, you would be conscious that the picture was being taken, and you would have the, you know, the material um, thing. Right um, and before, you know, before Kodak, basically, you know, having a picture was a super big deal. You know, yeah. a a picture was an amazing thing. So, you know, just our sense of expectation again, I think, is really is important. But I think physical um, objects too do. You know, even having something transformed into a physical object is mm -hmm. important because I remember there was a, a friend of mine, um, her daughter had done something in town that was important and so she was, look, you're on the, the newspaper's website. Yeah. She, so the newspaper came at the end of the week, I think it was a weekly newspaper. Yeah. And not in there. Yeah. She's like, what, well, you're on the website. She's yeah. like, I know, but it wasn't important enough to put in the paper. Yeah. And yeah. it's like that, they get it, you know, that, yeah. that there's, you know, that being, in a physical object is big is a bigger deal than being online because online they're online all the time. You know, yeah. It's like not a big deal. And I think just the transformation is a huge thing. Well I think I too have a, a four year old and an eight year old and they live their lives on tablets as much as I try to get them off of it. And you know, we will be sitting in our family room and I'm on my phone and yep. I'm watching T V and both of my boys are on a tablet or a computer and yeah. And then they're like, mommy, I want to watch something on the TV. And I'm like, well, you're on that. I want to watch something on the TV too. Yeah. But I think kids now um, are still lucky in the fact that their parents, like me, yeah. um, did not grow up the way they grew up. Mm -hmm. So we are used to having the pictures and the books. But it'll be my kids' kids yeah. that, because my kids, like the story you just told, this little girl wanted to see her picture in the paper, in the physical source. Mm -hmm. Because my grandchildren, their parents won't have that as part of yeah. what they're used to. They have it some, but it's going to be the more generations down the line that are going to not benefit from the physical thing as much. Because I'm still giving my kids books. That's what I'm a librarian. I love yeah, books. Yeah. Um, exactly. So I'm still making sure, and I hate technology in many ways. So I'm still making sure to give that to my kids. But my kids love technology, you know. So it'll be my grandchildren that I'm going to have to work to give physical things to, so that they will be able to experience that. What's amazing to me is, um, so my kids are older. My, I have um, late teen and young adults, um, and for my kids who did not, you know, they sort of transitioned to this kind of technology mm -hmm. halfway through their childhood in a sense, but became so enmeshed, I mean, just like unbelievably absorbed in it and to the point where with my youngest, you have, you have to still say, like, no, you actually have to read an actual book. Mm -hmm. But what, every time what he says to me is, every time he starts reading an actual book, you're like, oh, this is great. Mm -hmm. This is really great. I'm like, that's right, it is great. It is great and you're really loving it, you see? You know, it's, and there's this thing about orienting yourself. You can find yourself in the book. He knows how far he is. He can flip back and yeah. forth. You can quickly. Those are all the things that you know we, we do when we do deep reading, whether it's for pleasure or whether it's for scholarship or whatever it's for. You know that it's a really good technology. The book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it lasted a long time. Yes. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, my husband is going to be so happy that when I tell him about this session, <laughs> because I always give him a hard time about being a hoarder. And, yeah. <laughs> but like he has five different copies of Treasure Island. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. He has the one that he stole from his elementary <laughs> library. Uh -huh. He has the one that his grandmother gave him. And like I don't, I, I have a hard time understanding why you need five copies of the same yeah. book when it's in the public domain and everything like that. But every single one is yeah. different. Yeah. And now yeah. I understand yeah. that's the inside of his brain. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. It's just his brain. Mm -hmm. It's his brain, not his brain. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, go ahead. Um, but kind of on the flip side of that, I just toured our neighborhood elementary school and they use Chromebooks. And mm -hmm. I work in technology. I kind of roll my eyes when everybody's like, oh, we have Chromebooks. And I'm like, that's great. What do you actually do with them? <laughs> you know? um, but what they have software on them that allows kids to go at their own pace for reading and for math. Mm -hmm. And so you can have a classroom of 20 kids Mm -hmm. And they might be all at different levels, and they have some general instruction time, but then they have time to work at their own pace mm -hmm. on these Chromebooks on an application that takes them through reading and math. Mm -hmm. And so it's just, and then as the kids get older, they do collaborative um, editing of Google Docs, and they have to give review, they have to review their, their classmates' papers and put comments through Google Docs. And I'm like, Oh, that's what we do in the working world, <laughs> you know? Like, they're actually using the technology in the way that it's used in a professional um, environment, and... That makes me happy um, and sad. <laughs> yeah. 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 But, our school days are coming. Um, yeah. But it's just, it, I, I'm, I'm actually excited now to see that they're actually using the technology in a way to help students yeah. um, but then also giving them like real life experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was reading um, <clears throat> a great book um, on the theory of digital preservation, mm -hmm. theory and craft, Trevor, Trevor Owen's book, which is really, really interesting. But he talked about um, libraries acquiring um, in their special collections uh, authors' um, works. And they were talking about um, Salman Rushdie's mm -hmm. materials, which came with two laptops. And essentially came with the laptop environment in which he worked. So, and the question was, how do you recapture the material world in which he worked digitally? So, like, how do you keep that thing going so you can see that he's using the sticky notes feature actually as he's working? Um, or Carl Sagan's um, papers, which came on, I can't even remember, thousands and thousands of floppy disks. Um, so this question of like, there is a material reality to the digital world, mm -hmm. too. Well, Kindles way more when they're full. Yeah. They actually, there actually is, they're actually, <laughs> their weight changes when they, as you add more to the memory. Yeah. Actually <laughs> what kind of scale do you need, though? Uh, I forget, uh, there was a paper, like, it was yeah. like five, five or eight years ago, where they like, they actually, part. you know, yeah. they actually weighed Kindles, and they're like, as you add books, it actually becomes uh, into a It's like so a small weight. amount. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, but there is this, I mean, but there is this way in which, like, it's true that there's an aspect of the digital which is ephemeral and not material, but there's an aspect of the digital world which is material, and I think that's what you're getting at with the kids working on their Chromebooks. They're actually interacting with this physical object, you know, that there is a physical thing they're doing, and when they're doing something with it, that's different than, I think, like, reading or passively, you know, um, right. I think to your point There's about human, human neurology, physiology, all this being unchanging. So my son's a computer science student at McGill, and he does all this complicated stuff. But you look at his notebooks, mm -hmm. spiral notebooks, yeah. there is scads of writing, scads of writing. So we're like, why, why so much? And he's like, it helps me think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, like, oh, I, I feel like we're, uh, we're talking about two different, we're talking about preservation of the, the, the most significant yeah. historically imbued object, mm -hmm. and we're talking about memory creation. Right. Yeah. And it, it, yeah. what you were saying about the five different copies of Treasure Island, yeah. I had a fight with a friend of mine about 10 years ago, because I, well, get a, I'll get a book, and it's a book, and I'll take it in the bathtub, and I write on it, and I still say, I don't care, because yes. it's the other Bolin girl, yeah. and it's crap, yeah. and yeah. I can buy another one. Yeah. Yeah. But there was a point in history when if you had a book, 
Yeah. It was handwritten, yeah. and it cost your family, you know, a year yeah. of crops or something, and you're yeah. going to pass it down forever. And I think, I mean, to a certain we've already been through this, moving away from the one sacred, important object yeah. to there are thousands of copies. And now yeah. the medium has changed, but yeah. the idea that really you just... I don't know. You, well, you just but, but, killed one version of something that still exists. I think, I think the, thread, exists. the thread between them is, you know, humans are interpreting both of these. Yes. Right? Yeah. So which one? And creating values. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and they aren't necessarily at odds. They've been kind of pitched as at odds. You know, this is going to replace that. Yeah. And that's just inevitable. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's the case. I don't think that's good. I think that what we have to look at are, you know, like her example of the Chromebooks, there are places where this new interface makes a lot of sense, and it's helpful. But there are places where it's not, and there are places where it actually deprives you of, of important information or recollections, or you know, it deprives archivists of information and things of that nature. So yeah. I think there's there's that's kind of the thread. Is okay from from a human standpoint, not buying the technologist's um, version of of the world where humans are just something to be brought into the pipes but actually own the world uh, and run it, you know, what do we want? So, I think, there's another, I think there's another threat there, which is just asking us to be self-conscious about um, how these things are operating on us and mm -hmm. how we are contributing to them. Because this doesn't happen absent our participation. Mm -hmm. The preservation of George Washington's stuff happens because, you know, there has been, a, I mean, there are hierarchies of power in this, but, but there's a collective participation in a choice to do this and to really invest in this thing. So, being a cataloger at the Library of Congress, <laughs> why, uh, <laughs> what about the date? Should we fix that? Yeah, I know, I know, I know. I've written three different things. Really? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah um, this and, summer. The, and the other thing yeah. is that, that verso, I mean, if you look at it, yeah. that is someone else's genealogy. Oh, it is, totally. So, yeah, no, I know. So, and you know, I mean, it's, it, it's an, and the cataloging error actually, um, I would love to talk to you after. <laughs> um, but the cataloging error meant that um, there, there is a project at the Library of Virginia to collect tithable lists and to use those for African American genealogies, mm -hmm. and, that, and that's yeah. and that's not that's not there. Yeah. And about mm -hmm. Vernon, where they've been in trying to interpret, you know, this massive effort to interpret the lives of people who were enslaved at Mount Vernon, and they didn't have it in their database of a gazillion documents, and they were like, oh, <laughs> you know, an unknown doc like it's very rare when you could say an unknown George Washington thingy, you know. Yeah. Um, so it's actually this cataloging. And it's, it, is it a cataloging error, or is it just like a cataloging choice? Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it was a cataloging yeah. choice. Well, was it was it an There's individual so document, or was it bound together in part of this larger No, no, piece? it's two sides of the same thing. No, 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 not, not this piece, but yeah. like you said, it was within this large folio. So was the folio catalog, or was this the genealogy catalog separately? So the volume, the big volume, is just... Um, all of George, a bunch of George Washington's papers were at the State Department. They went to the Library of Congress in the 20th century. Library of Congress, at some point, yeah. somebody, mid-20th century, yeah. decides to put them in chronological yeah. order and then put them in these big red volumes. So it's so every item in those volumes are cataloged independently okay. and separately. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so that's actually what you're seeing here is that's the, so the, that's the cataloging. That's image two on the far right there. Image two, and you can see you can barely read it, right? But image two of George Washington genealogy chart. That's the list of tithables. Yeah. It was either it was either it was either a mistake or, or a poor choice. Yeah. Not not being in the mind of the person who cataloged yeah, yeah. it at yeah. that time, you can't but, say which yeah. which one it was. But, but. You know, I mean having having looked at tons of genealogical material for the eighteenth century, I can tell you the catalogers were pretty uninterested in it for a long time. It just didn't just it just didn't really do very much with it. Well, and you yeah, keep cattle in the 60s. Mount Vernon wasn't paying much attention to slave history at that point. Oh. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. So I have a weird story yeah. about the analog to digital. So when my mom passed away a few years ago, and she was a go getter from mm -hmm. day one. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know how much of it, but, at, but going through her things, I found this little 78 RPM record that she had cut, because they used to have booths where you could go and, and cut mm -hmm. records. And she was auditioning, essentially. Um, to do uh, readings. Wow. 
And so it was her voice as a 19 year old, which yeah. I'd never heard, which was amazing mm -hmm. and really cute. I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it sound like the doll. But um, so, but there was, I had no, uh, I had a turntable that could only be 45s and 33s, yeah. right? Because all the 78 turntables are in, you know, junkyards at this point. But you could, you could, tra I could transfer it to digital and speed it up and get the accurate recording. So again, you know, these things are not, they can be complementary, but again, what you're using it for, yeah. does that help for, you know, again, being, I think the big burden on all of us is just thinking harder about yeah. what's going on around us and what we're, how we're interacting with the world. So, yeah. But I'm sorry. I, I have two comments, of, and I'm thinking about your grad students and grad students everywhere who have to use ebooks yeah and how that is often unsatisfying sometimes it's very satisfying because it gives access mm -hmm. um, but um i was at a session earlier today uh 17 a comparison of 17 different ebook platforms <laughs> and one of the comments from the person analyzing it was um you know, some will let you download the whole book, and some you know, yeah. eke it out to you in chapters yeah. and things like that. And so, a, a plea to publishers to make the whole book available. Um, but then I also was thinking of your comment about annotating, and we've had conversations about that. With um, it varies by platform, but um, the sense that you can annotate the thing, but you can't necessarily own it, and you can't necessarily download your annotated version who owns your intellectual you know yep. property around uh, engaging with that text so there yep. there are a lot of issues to yep. be solved and um another point from this morning session on ebooks was some publishers are making it possible to within the platform to get a print copy to order mm -hmm. up a print copy yep that yeah, puts the, the cost for that print onto an individual researcher, and it might eventually put the cost onto the libraries um, if we get requests for that kind of thing. But um, it's uh, it, we've increased our access, but um, we've compromised on yeah, um, long-term usability. And I think we'll, as we talk about shared print repositories, I think we have to talk about shared print copies yeah. for the purpose of yeah. usability. Yeah, I have, I mean, I run a reading group um, for, outside, even outside of our classes, and um, uh, I just buy four copies of every book we're going to read for the year. So we do about a book a month at a lunch mm -hmm. thing for grad students, and, you know, because if there's if there's a physical copy, they will they will read it, and they will come to the reading group, and they will, you know, but if we're not, if we're not providing them, um, yeah. <coughs> But it's interesting Good because, university press sales too. I mean, even, <laughs> even the, again, back to the sort of design for distraction, you know, yeah. all this, all these things are designed for the, so I, I run a, uh, I, uh, the geysers run on a platform called Substack, which is subscription based. So you kind of get into the business model and all of this and how it feeds into things. But because of that, they designed it so that everything is delivered by email, which is interestingly, the only non monopolized platform right now. Yeah. It's the only totally, totally open platform mm. um, because, you know, social is owned by Facebook basically and Twitter. And, you know, you go on down the searches owned by Google, but email, totally democratized still. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that was one of their insights. But the other insight was that everything is delivered a single column about the width you would expect from a typo typographic standpoint of a, of a page. And so the reading length is normal beautiful typography actually the guy Chris Best really paid attention to it but there's nothing in the columns nothing yeah. in the and margins there's, there's real it's margins. just clean yeah it's just real margins and yeah. there's no it's so it's actually designed for deep reading yeah. and you look at these ebook platforms and I only know a few of them but even if you have an annotation tool floating out there or you know some sort of other helpful links about it you can also read this also read that you know it's it's that's distraction um, everything's at the bottom of this when there are additional links um, and so I was really impressed by that insight. You know, it, it's you know, two on two levels. One, email is still a democratic uh, distribution method, and nobody owns it. And that you can actually design so there is no distraction. And I think that that helps uh, with reading. And so I think you know, again, there are design choices that are being made. 
um, you know, and uh, then, you know, then again, like you printed it out. I did. Well, out. I was going to say, I, I, you know, I get, I get lots of things, and I print them out. And I, I wrote something for the guys around. What does an ebook smell like? Um, because yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> about the materiality of text, because yeah. I work with old books and they all smell, yeah. um, which I love. And um, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but it is true that, like, really, that I feel like the thing that's going to make a difference. I think the iPad with scribbling it really it makes that really really makes a difference. But you don't get you obviously you can only get that on certain you know applications. Mm -hmm. um, but if somebody was able to make that break so that you could actually scribble on your surface and have it preserved. Well, you notice that they. Difference. I mean, you can tell the technology people are starting to think about the tactile because yep. you notice the latest iPhones have the press harder and it gets yep. and it, and yep. it vibrates and like, yep. you know snaps yep. and then you get another menu set and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. So they're starting to see the yeah, third dimension to that needs to have interact. some. And, and then you had that place that <laughs> designed the skin phone case. Did you hear oh, about that? Gross. Yeah. yeah. So you could actually pinch it and like tweak no. it and let you know it would get sent to the press. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. we'll move on from that. But, yeah. <laughs> but I think mm -hmm. that, you know, again, the just kind of the realization that, that um, you know, again, I just will go back to the whole idea that we, you know, Personal memories, cultural memories, all of these things seem to require um, and benefit from uh, physical objects. Mm -hmm. And we can't, can't substitute. The substitutes are kind of pale by comparison. We shouldn't buy the claptrap that they don't. So. Do you guys have any thoughts on long-term... I have a very specific scenario that worries me, mm -hmm. but on long-term preservation. I used to work in a law library where we had 800-year-old found mm -hmm. Bellum or whatever at that yeah, yeah. point yeah. from yeah. from the UK, yeah. which was okay. Not the UK at that point, but you, yeah. you know what I'm talking. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've talked to some major law libraries now that are talking about completely canceling their U.S. law reports because the students are pulling them off the shelves and everybody's using them for Lexis and Westlaw. Mm -hmm. That's fine, but I don't believe that Lexis and Westlaw servers are going to exist 800 years from now. Exactly. Exactly. Well, I mean, I think right. about this all the time because. You know, one of the reasons why the 18th century is so well represented is because the paper itself yeah. doesn't go away. It's not like 19th and 20th century crap paper, you know? It's like that linen paper is good stuff. It's really, really sturdy. No, I agree. And the fact that we've invested so much in what is essentially a very, very fragile infrastructure. Well, it's, fra it's fragile commercially, too. If you have, so I, I do run some things on Facebook as far as, you know, like bands and stuff like that. And if you think, if, if the illusion is that you own that. If Facebook went under, that all go away. Yeah. Google yeah. Docs, that it's you know, convert as long as Yahoo, Google's success. You, 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 cl you clicked away your rights at some point. Oh yeah, yeah absolutely, yeah, yeah. absolutely. But a lot of people think that they own that. They, you know, like I'm an author and I'm a publisher, and it's like no, you're not. Been been they go away. Yahoo is. Those a Yahoo example. groups is a great example. Like I think about what is lost there. Like the the history really of um, of kind of like local networking and organizing through Yahoo mm -hmm. groups. Like. I have ones that are, you know, were started when my kids were in kindergarten to do various things, and they're just oh, it's on MySpace gone. and Blogger, and you can go down the list. I mean, there's yes. been a whole bunch of, you know, tech flameouts, and yeah. there's and no guarantee that those companies, even though they're huge now, aren't going to flame out. And what, you know, what happens to that? You don't own it. So yeah. I think that's a very good point. Yeah. yeah, but I do think there's sort of a mindset. I mean, for our generation. Um, our generation of that, the physical historical stuff. Like yeah. I just clean out my attic, yeah. and I've got my grandparents and great grandparents' photographs and yeah. letters and yeah. things. Yeah. And then I look at my niece and nephew, that next generation. Yeah. Do they want the hideous hand-drawn <laughs> portraits done in yeah. Norway yeah. from their great great grandparents? Yeah. 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 They might. Mine are hanging on my dining room wall. <laughs> 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 yeah. One thing I think you know, or they'll say, old. you know, in their head, you know, digitize it all, and then just say, uh, that, you know, it's like, uh, yeah. But I think, but I think, I think, I think too. Wall. I mean, yeah. yeah. I've been impressed by mm -hmm. one okay. one of the benefits I think of digital distribution and preservation at one level is I've been impressed by how much uh, historical culture kids know. Mm -hmm. They they know Maltese Falcon. They know you know they know a lot of things that you know you wouldn't expect. And it's like it's pretty impressive. Um, but um, 
Yeah, so that was Well, it. I was just going to say that, I mean, but that has been true forever, that most of what people own has just gone into the great beyond. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so um, I'm a person who keeps a lot of stuff. Not not a lot, a lot, but like, you know, I'd some Only selected. four copies of... <laughs> <laughs> some selected set of stuff. Um, but, I, you know, sometimes I think it's okay to... It, when we think about what we still have from, you know, it's okay. Things, things can go away. You know, keeping a couple of special things is a good idea. You know, selective cre curation is a good idea. And, you know, because a lot of stuff is just going to be gone. It's just how it is. But I do think there was this expectation, it's a kind of moment of expectation in the 20th century that, you know, we would, we could fix things in but time. What, would, was it ever realistic, though? No. <laughs> there are so many things about the mid 20th century which are crazy, right? You know, this, I mean, the idea that democracy is going to work. <laughs> um, seriously, like this what brief were moment. What were we on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A brief moment of like expanded broadcasts, right? I right. mean, no, literally. I, I really believe that. Like, the mid-20th century is like a weird moment. Um, and, but it set our expectations for a lot of things that um, have made it difficult to keep Either. things in perspective. Yes, indeed, indeed. Yeah. Anyway, so I know so, you're worried about like that we're going to lose all these, we're losing all these things from people our investment, I, I, and I, I keep trying to say we're going to lose a ton of stuff anyway, yeah, I think basically. I'm, I'm, but it's about how are we going to make choices about where, what we're going to lose. Choices. I yeah. think it's also identity. Um, yeah. You know, I think that it, you know, to me, some of the like, you know, the memories and the, the relationships I have with my own personal history yeah. being on display is kind of part of my identity. Yeah. Um, when I, you know, for various reasons, had to give up a large section of my record collection. Um, <laughs> I don't hold a grudge. Um, but, you know, to, the, to that point, you know, my daughter still will, um, you know, she uses Spotify, which is still not a profitable company. Um, and she's like, why are you still buying music on iTunes? And I'm like, because I want to own it. Yeah. You know, I want to be able to, to, like, save it on my backup drive. On my, yeah. You know, I, I want to own it because I'm even though some of it's crap. Um, but I still have that sense of ownership. When Spotify goes under, all her playlists are gone, all you know, her access yeah. to the music's gone, you yeah. know, all that stuff, and she's going to have to build it somewhere else. And it's like, okay, why don't you just own it on this device, which saves it pretty well. Um, but, you know, it, it's, if I still had, and, you know, even then you have, you know, you look at, think of digital music versus versus analog music, and a lot of, there's been the old, one of the first, Streaming brought back profits to the music industry, but vinyl did it first. Vinyl was the first sign of growth in the music industry revenue-wise since the uh, since about 2000. And the reason vinyl was popular was a, it sounds better. It really does. The dynamics are better. The sound variation is is greater. There's not as much compression. All of that. But album cover art, yeah. liner notes, it's cool. all of that stuff. So people, you know, you know. The, Knowing the lyrics to a song, knowing who produced it, who played drums on it, all of that stuff was a natural part of LPs and the physical album that you know, evolved over time. And now that's all pretty much gone away. You can't even get metadata on it in most cases uh, when you go into digital music because there's no um, there's no incentive for anybody to present that. So. You know, they're probably. I remember there were there were great session you know, musicians and producers and all this. You knew which record label you know put out Springsteen and Billy Joel. It was Columbia because they had the same artwork on the spine of all their albums and all this stuff. You knew the look, and you knew they had great artists and great taste. You knew who you know, uh, uh, Bob. What was his name? Um, you can look it up. I'll look it up later. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually going to think about that. Bob, Clear, Bob Clearman um, was a great. You know, he was a great master. Yeah. He would master albums in a fantastic way. Yeah. Nobody knows that anymore. And um, so, you know, I think that, again, the physical objects, people are still returning to them because there are rewards to to visiting, like, you know, your kids with the, the Google Photo books. It's, it's rewarding. It's fun. It's interesting to touch memories and to, to you know, to have a physical interaction with what is ultimately a cerebral experience. Well, I think so. the thing that brings us all together here is the thing is books, really, because the, the, mm -hmm. the real connective tissue here is that I think there's a, a strong sense that if we if we <laughs> overinvest in digital books, essentially in right. e-books, and we underinvest profoundly um, in physical books, we lose a lot, a lot, a lot. And so do students and yep. historians. Yep. And, yeah. 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 
another LC catalog here. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, LC friends. <laughs> um, I catalog the rare materials section, uh -huh. so I may be able to work at the trees for you. Um, Excellent. I know a little bit of catalogs and Jefferson Collection. Um, and I work on Hawaiian imprints, which are the first um, materials printed on the Hawaiian Islands, and actually the first mm -hmm. printing press for West of the Rockies. Wow, that's wow. cool. Um, and so I definitely agree that interacting with a physical object gives you something that affects That's just because you get trips to Hawaii. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> At the same time, yeah. though, there are still people in Hawaii who yeah. live their whole lives there. Yeah, and we'll never be able to travel five thousand miles. Yes, to see this thing. So there's a mm -hmm. yes, there's a virtue to the digital surrogacy, sure. Yeah. For sure. For sure, for sure. Yeah. Well cool. then, then then when I say to you that I had to work very hard on Julie Miller to be able to get to the inside yes. <laughs> I was like, I've worked with her for years too, and it's like seriously. <laughs> Anyway. I kind of yeah, understand you were talking about the George Washington materials moved all the way around. You know, they didn't just stay at yeah. Mount Vernon, was it, whatever. And so yeah, I think it right kind right of speaks to, I'm a librarian in uh, O'Ree County, uh -huh. and so uh, I think we have a uh, kind of, we need to respect the communities and get stuff from the communities yeah. and then pipe them out into DPLA and all these different things because we're the ones. Yes. We yes. can kind of help keep all this stuff a lot. Yes. But, yes. And we're the ones who select what to present in yeah. the first place. It's a yeah. very important role. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. Somebody said that um who said they had their their childhood copy of something they didn't go back to the library. Oh, oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. So this summer I um I had a book that I checked out in nineteen seventy two from the Carnegie Library in Pittsburgh. <laughs> And I went back to the Carnegie Library to get the book back and to pay my fine. <laughs> um, it was supposed to be, it was, I calculated it at five cents a day, which is what it said, and they were like, it's more now. And I was like, I'm not paying more than $382. <laughs> I was like, I'm giving you the $382 because it's a donation, but I, I, I don't think I can pay the <laughs> anyway, It was pretty funny, but it was a great, it was actually a great experience because that experience of being in that library, which is so Pittsburgh centric, you know, and it was like a, just a very profound experience, I thought. Um, I agree. I mean, libraries are just like such community mm -hmm. resources, and all the things that we ask libraries to do, and that there's a million things we're asking libraries to do. I really want libraries to have books. <laughs> this is the thing I really want. I mean, I know there are a million things, and libraries are amazing community um, centers, but I really want them to have, I mean, books and, cult and community artifacts and all of the kind of. You know, mm -hmm. What was yeah. the book that you returned? Oh, it was Mary Poppins. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Yeah, and my mother had sent it to me. She, my mother and father moved, and she sent it to me several years ago. And she sent it to me with one of my seventh grade grammar textbooks, which apparently I also didn't return. <laughs> and here are all the things. So anyway, was it a criminal record? <laughs> exactly. Totally. Totally. I mean, I really it was like weighing on me the thing because I love that library. It's so profound the experience of that library. Yeah. It's like. Oh my God! Yeah, you have to find and everything. You're pretty close to Grant. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. I know. Because Judy would have no mercy. I know. <laughs> they were very sweet about it. I have to say. Anyway, they were probably just shocked you brought it back. Yeah, yeah, they were. The guy was like, "What?" <laughs> it's okay. Like we don't even. This book is not even any. We're not even. I was like, "You're not gonna put it back on the shelf." I can guarantee it is out of the catalog. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Anyway, after I explained that I really was going to give them the money, he was like, okay. And then when somebody else came up, we had a conversation. So, but only if you put it back. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. You reshelled it. I should have said that. I should have yeah. yeah. Or they could have stamped it out and given it back to me. But, oh, there you go. You know, but I was like, that no. That would have been nice. Actually. I know, yeah. Mm -hmm. You thought this through. I did, but <laughs> I wasn't going to push it really. Yeah. <laughs> I can always go back and steal it again. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, with, with that from the theft house. <laughs> exactly. Uh, thank you all anyway, for thanks. this conversation yeah. and for attending. We really yeah. appreciate it. Yeah. I hope it was. I hope it gives you food for thought. It's really interesting. Uh, and uh, get you find some more print books. Yeah. 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 Thank you. 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 Thank